Romans 12. Romans 12. And um, I want to follow up with some things I was preaching on last Sunday. Remember that it opens up with the call to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And, of course, this presenting our bodies a living sacrifice is all about giving ourselves to God, which is the title of this series of messages. And then I pointed out to you that as we begin at verse 9 and move through the end of the chapter, we find snippets of instruction that function like a mirror in which we can look at it and we can see and analyze ourselves and find out if truly we are giving ourselves to God. Where might we be deficient in that area? And as you analyze every one of these pieces of instruction, you will see that they all involve some form of self-sacrifice. That's what discipleship following Jesus is all about, self-sacrifice. Let a man deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so we were looking at the verse uh, 9. Let love be without dissimulation, which is pretense, putting on a show, not real, feign, hypocrisy. Let your love be without that. And as I pointed out to you last Sunday, we wouldn't have that instruction given to us if there wasn't a danger that that very thing could happen. And I pointed out to you at the end of the sermon that we all struggle to keep our religion real. That's why I selected the songs that I did this morning, talking about how easily our devotion dies, hosannas languish on our tongues, and how we struggle with doubts. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good. It was very quiet in the room last Sunday. I think there was a lot of conviction that was coming forth with that message, which is good, because I talked about looking you right in the face and asking you certain questions. Do you love the Word of God? Do you love God? Do you love God like the Bible teaches us to love God? And I think it caused everybody to do some introspection. And today, I would like to pour some salve in the wounds opened last Sunday. So I ask that you give your rapt attention to what I have to say today. Because again, we all struggle to keep our religion real. Now let's just go back and look at this verse again. Verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. I pointed out to you that the object of the love there is not defined, but it's obvious from the context that we're talking about spiritual love, the love that is the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking here about what the Bible calls charity, and it's very interesting that if you look in an Oxford's English Dictionary, I mean, that's like the standard of the English language, and you look at that fine print that makes up that hu humongous, if that's even a word, volume you will find that the primary meaning of the word charity is Christian love. Love after the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a self-giving, self-sacrificing love for the good of others. And so we notice that as we examine the scripture, we are taught as regards the love that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit to love God, to love God's children, to love our neighbor by keeping the laws of God in respect to our relationship to him to love the Word of God, to love good. And that particularly comes out in our verse when it says, Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good and to love God's house. Now, one of the things that is interesting about love or charity is we find it described for us what it's like so, how we, so we can know whether we have it or not and whether we're exercising it or not we find the characteristics of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great charity chapter. And we have this expression in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 13. Speaking of charity, it said, It rejoiceth not in iniquity. If the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, this is the reason we feel shame and sorrow for our sins, that we cannot find satisfaction, that even if the pleasure of it was for a season, inevitably the shame and horror of it comes to dawn upon our souls. 
And instead of finding joy, we find great grief and sorrow and self-loathing because of it. That's an evidence the love of God's in you people. So that should bring you some comfort. It rejoiceth not in iniquity, but in the truth. And so it's interesting that in the context of saying, let love be without dissimulation, in the same verse, we have the sentence, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Because true spiritual love that is born of God hates evil. In fact, we saw that as those who love the Lord, we, we gave you a verse, Psalm 97, 20, those who love the Lord, Psalm 97, 10, pardon me, Psalm 97, 10 said, ye that love the Lord hate evil. And I pointed out to you, and I think it's important to remember this, that even though love and hate are opposites, they are really two sides of the same coin. That if you love good, you will, by default, hate evil. And this is one of the characteristics of our blessed Lord Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1, 8 and 9. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Interesting that Jesus was not only here described by love, which is what everybody thinks of when they think of Christ, as well they ought. <laughs> but he was also described by hatred. His love of righteousness was of such that he hated iniquity. So if we really love good, if we really love what is right, then we will abhor that which is evil, and that love will drive us to cleave to that which is good and not part with it like someone, cle like someone cleaves to a glutinous surface. Now, I just want to stop a met for a moment and look at two words in that verse 9, good and evil. If there is no such thing as good and evil, then Christ's death on the cross was unnecessary. The whole purpose, for it, when you look at the Bible word evil, it actually is used in two different ways. It refers to sin, iniquity, what we would call moral wrong. But it also refers to the consequences, such as the punishments that we suffer because of our wrongs, the sickness, the disease, the death, and all of the, the oppression, and all of these things that flow out of man's iniquity. It refers not only to iniquity, but to the consequences. And when you look at the death of Christ, what was it all about? He was dying for our moral wrong. He was dying for our evil, for our sin, suffering the consequences, the evil that flows out of our sin in his suffering and death. So that if there is no such thing as evil, the death of Christ becomes a joke. And the Bible, of course, is a lie. Because from the very beginning of its pages, it is constantly drawing this distinction between good and evil, good and evil. And it's interesting that when we talk about abhorring evil, this is evil wherever it shows itself. Whether we are talking about moral evil, whether we are talking about social evil, whether we are talking about political evil, whether we're talking about relational evil, or whether we're talking about our own personal evil. And you really know that you're making ground as a Christian when the evil you abhor the most is the evil you find in yourself. I really have a problem with people that spend so much time studying all the evil that's going on in the world and in the political spectrum and get so caught up and so absorbed in that that they don't really spend much time looking at themselves and the evil that lurks within themselves. That's where our abhorrence of evil should really start and be most focused if we're really going to grow as Christians. But the question arises, what decides good and evil? Who decides what is good? Or what decides it? Or who decides what is evil? Or, 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 or what decides it? And there are various answers. Some people would say that it's a personal choice. Uh, we decide ourselves what is good and what is evil. Oh, that's a joke. Because what if I decide I hate you? And what if I decide to kill you? Obviously, no society can survive where good and evil are determined in the eyes of each and every individual. 
Well, then somebody might say, well, I think it's the social mores. It's the general consensus of society. Oh, really? Well, then what about when it was the general consensus in Southern society to have slavery as it was practiced in the South? Did that make it right? Uh, what about uh, societies and cultures that have practiced genocide? Uh, if that's the social norm, does that make it right? What about cultures in the past that practiced child sacrifice? Because that was the social or cultural norm, did that make it right? Obviously, societies can't be the final arbiter of right and wrong because the opinions and mores of society shift all over the place. They have shifted hugely within my 71 years of life, I can tell you for a fact. It's not the same now as it was when I was growing up in the 50s. So, this is what brings us to the revelation that God has given us in His Word. We go back to the basics that there is a God. Creation proclaims there is an infinite, eternal, almighty, single God. And reason demands that if, we, if God made us, and He did, it stands to reason He'd let us in on the purpose for why He made us, which then reasons out from that to a divine revelation, which we as Christians believe is found in the Holy Bible. That that is where God has given us the definition of good and of evil. Now, there is a thought that escaped me a moment ago that has just recurred, and I wish to return to it. I talked about the various kinds of evil that we hate wherever we find it. That also includes religious evil, and there is religious evil. And the Lord let us know that in the very beginning of human history, in that Cain and Abel brought to each brought a sacrifice. Cain's was accepted, or pardon me, Abel's was accepted, and Cain's was rejected. And Cain hated his brother Abel because Abel's works were righteous and the Bible says his were evil. His religion was not according to what God revealed that God wanted and therefore God considered it evil. I heard a man that's a preacher in one of these mega churches say one time, I thought this was one of the most ridiculous things I had ever heard a man that called himself a preacher say. He said, it does not matter how you worship, it matters what you worship. Isn't that pathetic? That man hasn't read the fourth chapter of Genesis, where God let us know in the beginning of time that it matters how we worship. And so we hate religious evil. We want to make sure it's right, and we want to make sure it's real. But that comes further as we move into the study. But when we talk about this love that is to be without dissimulation, that actually manifests itself in the next sentence, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, we want to remind ourselves, we want to go back to what we read about charity in 1 Corinthians 13, 6. That charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Charity loves truth. Charity wants to know the truth. That's the thing. Now that brings us to the question of truth. Is there truth? And if so, is it knowable? Is there truth? And if so, is it knowable? First thing off the bat, if there is no truth, you involve yourself in a pitiful, frightful, logical contradiction. If is, there is no truth, I posit the question, is it true there is no truth? If it is true, there is no truth, and obviously there's truth. You see, it is an inescapable concept. You cannot escape that truth is there. The question is, where is it? What is it? Now, truth is knowable. Some people, when they look at all of the confusion, for example, let's just distill it down to religion. When they look at all the confusion in the religious world and all the myriads of denominations and shades of Christianity and interpretations, and that's not only true of Christianity, it's true of the Muslim religion. There are various kinds of Muslims, there are various kinds of Jews, various kinds of Hindus. You, within any field of religion, there's all these different ideas and interpretations, and one looks at this sea of all this different stuff, and one might, and people do, people do, 
They might arrive at the conclusion that it's just all too much, it's all too big, we can't figure it out, and so I'll choose my stupidity, and you choose your, and and that's the way it works. No, no, it doesn't work that way. If truth is not knowable, the Bible is a lie. The Savior, Jesus Christ, is a liar. Because Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8, 31 and 32, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. It can't be stated more plainly that truth is knowable. Christ is telling us the circumstances under which we may make that discovery. If you continue in my word, you stay with what Jesus said, and we have the record of it in our Gospels. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? You really are. There's no fake here. You are the real McCoy. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, and then you have a statement like this, just a couple in First John, First John and Second John. In First John 2:21, John writes, "I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. How do you recognize a lie? How do you recognize an error? There's only one way by knowing the truth. You must know truth in order to know a lie. You must know truth in order to discover an error. That's how you know it's an error, because it contradicts what you know is the truth. And then in Second John, Second John, it opens in the first verse, extremely important verse, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Notice, I have given you three verses that flatly, plainly say that truth is knowable. You see, without truth, how can we know what's good? How can we know what's evil? If we do not believe that truth is knowable, again, what defines good? And if you find a definition, how do you know it's real? How do you know it's right? If you don't know truth, truth is essential to the discovery of good and evil. So I think it is interesting that right on the heels of talking about love, let love be without pretense, let love be without feigning, let love be without dissimulation. He follows right from that into abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good because love, charity rejoices in the truth and the truth will define good and evil. So you know what you're supposed to abhor and what you're supposed to cleave to. Now, let's understand something very clearly. Truth cannot be known exhaustively. Truth comes from God. He is called the God of truth. We can never know God exhaustively because God is infinite. We're finite. It will take us an eternity to discover God, to learn about God, which means we'll never ever fully know because he is an infinite being. Truth cannot, hold it, hold it, this is so important. Truth cannot be known exhaustively, but truth can be known sufficiently and adequately to please God in both what we believe and in what we practice. Truth cannot be known exhaustively, but it can be known sufficiently to please God in matters of faith and in matters of action. And if we love truth, and true love loves it and rejoices in it, it follows that we will seek it as far as we can. And it means as we pursue that truth, we are going to discover along the way what is error. And as we pursue that truth, it will mean acknowledging error, hold it, hold it, even... For mostly, if that's a word, in ourselves. In ourselves. Truth will make those discoveries of error in politics, error in religion, error in social mores. 
error in our families, error in our relationships, and error in our own thinking and attitudes and hearts and actions. If we really pursue truth, we will make that discovery. Now the rub comes, is what are we going to do when we make that discovery? Now, I can tell you this. I just want to talk about the realm of religion. I can stand before you and look all of you in the eye in the presence of Almighty God whom I serve and tell you that I have examined other religions. That I have not just come at this that I believe because this is all I know. I have examined other religions. When I started out my journey of seeking God, if you will, I joined the Methodist Church down the street. I have told the story about what led me to do that. I was a loner. I was a nerd. I was made fun of by my peers. And so I wanted to bond with young people, and I figured, well, what better place to do it than in a church? So I go with the Methodist Church to bond with the young people. But I got very serious about the religion. In fact, the pastor told my mother, I took my religion too seriously. Can you fathom that? But so he did. He just looked at it as a common sense thing. Don't get too worked up about it. And so what ended up happening is I was still at odds with the young people because I took it seriously and they didn't. But at any rate, the Methodists are fully Arminian. They believe Christ died, God loves everybody, Christ died for everybody, everybody's got a chance. And they believe you have to do something to get your salvation and they think you can lose it and you have to do something to get it back. I don't think I ever went that far with Methodism. But I did buy the Arminian doctrine at first, and I, my mother didn't believe it. She was a primitive Baptist, and I used to argue about it with her. Well, then as I continued on, and there was all this liberal stuff that was getting into the Methodist church. Mary Dell knows a lot about it. She was going to a Methodist college, and she remembers. I mean, I went to a Methodist youth camp, and the son of one of the of, of, a, of the pastor of the largest Methodist church in Jacksonville, Florida, was planning on becoming a preacher and said he did not believe in the virgin birth. And that just took me right out of the Methodist church. I couldn't handle that. So I went to a conservative Presbyterian church. And they believed that God loved everybody and it's dependent on your free will choice, but they also believed in election and predestination that it was up to the will of God. And they said, well, this is just these two things and they're contradictory to us. We can't reconcile it, so we have to accept them both. I had a little trouble with that. Then I moved to Birmingham and I heard a preacher named Pharaoh Griswold and he didn't believe that. And he was the one that opened my eyes to finally see John 3:16, God so loved the world. And it was a journey. I've been on a journey. But I'm telling you all this to say that I know something about the stuff that's out there, what's out there. I've studied about Roman Catholicism. I know what they believe. I know more than some of them know. We have a member of this church. Uh, his ex-wife, raised Catholic, hit the ceiling when she found out that this church practiced foot washing because she did not know on Monday, Thursday, every year, the priest washes 12 people's feet. She didn't know that. I knew that. We had a woman that used to be a Catholic that joined this church that was shocked to find out they believe the bread and wine become the literal body and blood of Jesus. How could you miss that? I know what they believe. I've, 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 I've studied some of their beliefs and their writings. I get it from the horse's mouth. I have read the Quran. I know something about Islam. Matt Ruma did an extensive study. I have his research in a notebook in my office. I have a book written by a Muslim to set forth the beliefs of Islam. I know something of what they believe. I know what's wrong with it. I know what's wrong with Hindu philosophy. I've looked at it. I've looked at Buddhism. I've looked at these different things. I've studied about the different cults. I've got the Book of Mormon in my home. I've got a book about Christian science. I've, I've got their own writings. I've got their own sayings, what they say about themselves. I've looked at it. And that's why I am where I am today. Because as far as I can see, I'm preaching to you and leading you in the way of the truth. I'd be a hypocrite if I wasn't doing, if I thought it was otherwise. 
It is my job to be a preacher of the truth. It is my job to expose error. It's my job to, to provide information for you to be able to make wise choices with regard to religion and regards to church. So I preach what I preach. I do what I do because I honestly before God believe it is the truth, having in all honesty looked at other things and found them logically inconsistent and in error. Now, I've been bringing you up a lot lately, Matt. That sermon you preached the other day, listen to this, folks. I told him, I said, Matt, that was one of your best. He thought it was one of his worst. Marydell thought it was one of his best. So that shows you an example of what Paul said. I don't judge myself. He made such salient points. But this is something you said years ago regarding the school to which you send your children that is now called the Bloomfield Christian. It used to be called some kind of leadership academy years ago. They teach the trivium, and, 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 and which is an excellent form of education. It's medieval in its origin, where they emphasize logic and rhetoric and grammar. And anyway, that's the side. But Matt Rumor was talking with some of the school leadership, and this was something they weren't wanting to say. But Matt said it. You know, they thought it. But he said, I send my children to this school because if I'm going to send my kids to a school, I think this is the best school to send them to. You remember that? I remember that. And he says the same thing about the church he comes to. He said, I come to this church because I believe it is the best. It is the closest to the truth that I can find, and that's why I come here. Because I think it's the best choice. Isn't that logical? I mean, if you're interested in truth and you want to please God, you really want to please God, why wouldn't you go where you think you come the closest to doing it? And I'm not saying we're perfect. I've never said that. I'm not saying there aren't Christians elsewhere or there aren't uh, even legitimate churches elsewhere. I've never said that. But it's my responsibility as a minister wherever I find error, even in the most sincere, but I point it out as something we need to shun and cleave to that which is good. That's my responsibility. What else am I supposed to do? How can I in good conscience say before God that I have preached as much truth as you've shown me and, 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 and when I know that I haven't done that? I have to be able to face God. So, very wise statement, Matt. And my challenge to anybody is this. If you can prove that what we practice here, and again, we're not perfect. Why do you think we have church discipline? Why do you think sometimes we dismiss people from the fellowship? Because there's imperfections. N nobody knows better than I do as the overseer of this congregation that we've got our wrinkles and we've got... Why do you think I come preaching week after week after week trying to iron the wrinkles out and straighten this out and straighten that out and address this problem and address that problem? Because we're human beings and we're imperfect and we've got our flaws. I know that. That's, that's, we, we just keep trying to grow. But still, it's our responsibility to follow the truth as far as we see it. I don't see any other reasonable course of action on the part of a person that professes to be the follower of him who said, I am the truth. Now, if you can prove this, we're wrong here, we're practicing wrong, or we're preaching wrong, or we believe wrong, uh, if you can prove this, and you can prove that something else is better or something else is true, do me the favor and show me. I ask you to show me. Because truth does not shun investigation. Truth does not shun investigation. But here comes the rub, people. Here comes the rub. That as we pursue truth, as we seek truth, as we learn truth, inevitably that truth is going to interfere with our desires and with our emotions. And we are going to face a choice when, we can, when some truth comes along that exposes an error in ourselves. We're going to face a choice. Do I just set that truth aside and pursue the error? Or do I abandon the error and go with the truth? Every one of us faces that because we are sinners. There is that about us that is misaligned with truth. Why do you think Christ died on the cross? 
Why do you think we have Christian growth? Why do we think we have a struggle? Because we all have that within us that is misaligned with truth. And so when we come across error, then we have a decision. There is a saying, I heard it from Pastor Phil Yunker. I thought it was worth its weight in gold. When an honest man, when an honest man is confronted with truth, He either submits to that truth or he ceases to be an honest man. May I say it again? When an honest man is confronted with truth, he either submits to that truth or he ceases to be an honest man. And so this is why we point out, present your body a living sacrifice of sacrifice Remember, the Bible says, buy the truth. The truth is going to cost you something. But he says, buy it and sell it not. Because it is a most valued and precious possession. But here's the problem. Truth will impose restraints on our emotions, on our desires, on our ideas, our dreams. It will impose restrictions. And listen to this. There is within us, because we are fallen sinners, that wants to throw off those restraints. We don't want to be bound by what truth is telling us. But I want you to listen to this as one of the most solemn things that I will ever bring to your attention. And that is that wanting to remove the restraints of truth led to the crucifixion of him who said, I am the truth. Shall I say it again? Because these are bombs. The yearning to throw off the restraints of truth led to the crucifixion of him who is the truth. And I shall now prove that from the word of God. Turn to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. The first two verses you can connect with Acts chapter 4 and it will show these verses were fulfilled. In the trial, the rejection, and the crucifixion of the Son of God. Why do the heathen rage? That was the Roman government. And the people, those were the Jews and the Jewish leadership. Psalm 2 and verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That is against Jesus, his Christ, saying... Notice what drove them to do what they did. Let us break their bands asunder. Bands constrict. Bands restrain. Let us break their bands asunder. In Pilates class, we have bands. And we use these bands in the exercises because they impose some restraint that causes you to have to exercise the muscle against the restraint to build it. That's what we use them for. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords. Those are those things that tie and restrict and restrain and cast away their cords from us. The Jewish leadership did not want to submit to the restraints that the teaching of Jesus placed upon them. They were faced with truth and they didn't like it. They wanted to keep it as they had it because it served their personal interests. Pilate didn't even want to have him crucified. But he knew that if he did, he'd have public insurrection on his hands. And so for political expediency to retain his power and influence, he threw off the restraint that the truth of the situation placed upon him. Rather than risk the political fallout, he chose to give the Jews what they want and have the Son of God crucified. So bear in mind that whenever truth comes up against you, against your emotions and against your desires, and you have that urge to want to just throw it off so you can have what you want, bear in mind that that is the very, very mindset that led to the crucifixion of your blessed Lord. Again, truth does not shun investigation. We can tell you why Christ was so hated and despised. Because he told the truth. That's the reason. Look at the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Very searching words. Look at John chapter 3. 
John chapter 3, verse 19. John 3, 19. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. Did not Jesus say, I am the light of the world? The light of life? Light is come into the world. And that's what truth is. It's a light. It shines. It exposes error and evil. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. And why did they? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh he to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. He doesn't want to sit under the sound of truth. He wants to get away from it. He wants to shut his ears to it. Because it's exposing something in himself that he doesn't want to face. Again, Matt, in your sermon, there are those questions we don't want to ask because we intuitively know the answer. And the answer means self-sacrifice we don't want to make. And so we shun it. We try to block it out. It is interesting, I think, that in the letters that I read to you last Sunday of the two young people that left our fellowship, you will notice something very interesting about those letters. They did not criticize anything that we believe in this church, anything we stand for in this church. They did not criticize me or find fault with me or make me to blame. They just simply, plainly acknowledge, I don't love God enough. He's not central to my life. Basically, I want to do what I want to do. So I'm going to cast the cords and the bands away and go my way. That was what it was. And while on the one hand, it was honest of them to say so, but it's a shame that that had to be the truth of them. How, how tragic I pray to God to give them repentance. But now I told you that in challenging you in the way that I did last Sunday, and had you walking out that door asking yourself, do I love God enough? Do I love God enough? Do I love the Bible? How? What is the honest answer to that face-to-face, eye-to-eye question? Do you love the Word of God? I'm going to ask you this morning, if I were to say to you, do you love God And you answered me and said, yes, but I do not love him as much as I should. That is an honest answer, and that is a good answer. If I told you, do you love the word of God? And you said, yes, but not as much as I should, not like I ought to. I would say that is an honest answer, and it is a good answer. If I were to ask you this morning, do you heart and soul believe what we preach and stand for here? And you said, well, I believe it, but I struggle with doubts at times. That is an honest answer, and that is a good answer, as I shall proceed to show you, because I would have to answer the same way. Here's something very interesting, and I hope this pours some salve in any wounds that might have been opened by the sermon last Sunday. We need go no further than the epistle of 1 Thessalonians. I am going to show you that the Thessalonian church had a commendable faith and a commendable love, and yet an imperfect faith, a deficient faith, and a love that could stand to be increased. Let me show you. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. This is, this is very comforting. 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to look at verse 3. I'll I'll give you verse 2 of the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of your in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. They had a faith that stirred Paul to thank God for it. And labor of love, a love that stirred Paul to thank God for it. And patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. He could write to them in chapter 2 and verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. 
Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Or shall I take you to verse 6 of chapter 3? But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Their faith was commendable. It was a faith for which Paul would thank God, acknowledge it as effectual, or the word of God being effectual because of it. It, it was a faith enough that the Bible really got hold of them and took an effect. And a faith that brought the holy apostle comfort in his afflictions. I call that a commendable faith. He also commended them for their love. And he said this in chapter 4 and verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Hold it now. And indeed, that means really, truly, this was real, folks. You do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. Ah, oh, but even though they had a commendable love, what does he say? But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. They loved but they could stand to love more. You got it? They loved, but they could stand to love more. Look at his prayer for them in verse 12 of chapter 3. Look at the prayer. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. I want you to notice that spiritual love, Christian love, is a purifying principle. It leads you to abhor that which is evil and love that which is good. But the thing I want you to see is that even though they had this commendable, real love that they practiced, Paul said, you need more. I'm praying you abound more. But what about that faith? What about that faith that moved him to thank God? That commendable faith that brought him comfort in his afflictions. Look at what he says there in verse 9 of chapter 3. Verse 9 in chapter 3. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying, hold it now, exceedingly, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Even though they had a commendable faith, it wasn't everything it needed to be. It had its lack. It had its deficiency. Their love was commendable, but it needed to increase. You see, that's what, this is what Christian living is all about. It's about growth. Grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It goes back again, sorry Matt, to what you said in your sermon when you quoted Charles Spurgeon as saying that it's the man who really believes that recognizes how much he doesn't. That's true. That's true. The more faith you have, the more you realize how lacking you are. The more love you have, the more you realize how lacking you are. The more you love God, the more you realize you don't love Him enough. The more you hate evil, the more you realize you don't hate it enough. The more I know about the Bible, the more I realize how little I know. It works inversely. And the holier you are, the more unholy you perceive yourself to be. So look at that Thessalonian epistle and take comfort. But unbelief, unbelief, oh what a struggle we all have with unbelief. Because you see, when you start, let's just say you start doubting what we believe here, the doctrine we preach, the Bible we preach, what we are. Let's say you start doubting that. When you start doubting it, your love for it will start to cool. Because it's like I said to you last Sunday, love and faith work in tandem. As faith increases, love increases. As love decreases, faith decreases. They both work in tandem. 
And so we all have a struggle with our faith, a struggle with unbelief. And let me give you some examples. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. You talk about having struggles with doubts. Do you? Of course. And so do I. So do I. I, have, I, I well, let me give you this example. So do I. Look at this, Matthew chapter 11. Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. And he says of him in verse 11, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen, arisen a greater than John the Baptist. You go back from the beginning of the Bible all the way up to John the Baptist. We've got Abraham, We've got Isaac, Jacob, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Go down the list. And John the Baptist is at the top. He was the greatest of them all. But then he says, notwithstanding he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Because you see, being in the church on this side of the cross and the resurrection, we understand more than John did. Because John got beheaded before all those events occurred. But that's another subject, and I don't really want to go into detail with that other than just to say that John the Baptist was a great man. The Son of God said so. He was the fulfillment of prophecy. He was the forerunner of Jesus. He baptized the Son of God. He saw the Spirit of God descending down upon him from heaven in the form of a dove and knew from that that this was indeed the Son of God, and he bore witness. John the Baptist was a great man. But I want you to look at an experience John had. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? This man that had seen the Holy Spirit descend upon Christ, assuring him that Christ was the Son of God, is now in prison and doubting that Jesus is the Christ. This man that introduced him to the world with the cry, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, which has heard the world round. I think that is one of the most amazing things. The cry of John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God, is heard the world around. A cry that was made in a wilderness and without the benefits of modern technology has nonetheless found its way around the globe. Every time, and I'm not, I'm not exalting the Catholic Mass, don't get me wrong, but you ex-Catholics will know what I'm going to say. They did the same thing in the Methodist Church. Every time we had communion, once a month, we read a ritual out of the back of the hymnal. This is part of the Catholic ritual. It's part of the Methodist ritual. I'm sure it's part of an Episcopal ritual. The Lutherans probably say it too. Because Lutherans and Episcopalians are just Catholics at flunk Latin. But at any rate, it is said... It is... Oh, that's an old joke. I'm surprised you'd laugh at that. Anyway, it, it is said in every Mass... And I don't agree with the, with the context in which the statement is made, because they're referring it to that bread that they think has now become Jesus. But nonetheless, the statement is made, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. We used to sing it every month in the Methodist church. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is the very words of John the Baptist that are now being sounded some 2,000 years later. The voice of one crying in the wilderness heard throughout the earth. But so this man that was so unique in the program of God, considered by even our Savior to be great, had his moment when he doubted that Jesus was the Christ. So if you have struggles with doubting your religion or doubting your faith, do not feel alone. The blessed forerunner of our Lord struggled with the same. I do. My faith has cost me, people. I, to take a stand on a doctrinal point that is clearly revealed in Scripture cost me my entire standing in a denomination where I was becoming more and more a leading figure in that denomination. I was in demand I was getting invitations all over the country to go do meetings, special meetings. People loved in that denomination to hear me preach. Every bit of that, down the tubes, 
because I was confronted with truth. And I had to go with the truth even though I knew there would be a price to pay. I've lost friends. I've had people leave this church. And I've suffered criticisms over the year and over the years. And and I look at myself and I think, okay, is this real? Is this real? Am I missing something? And so here's John doubting Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus answered when they came and told him that. He said in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And this was all public record. And the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Okay, what do you do? When you have your John moment, you go back and you look at the basics. You go back and you look at the proofs. And they're all there. You just go back. And you know what? That's what I do. Whenever sometimes I wonder about this stuff, is it real? Is it true? I go back and I review the arguments for the existence of God. I go back and I review the arguments for the veracity, the truth of the Bible the fact that it is historically and scientifically and archaeologically accurate, prophetically accurate, and furthermore, personally, very relevant. I can stand before you this morning, having been a Christian since I was 17 years old, and say, this book has never failed me. I failed it plenty of times, but it has never failed me. In my darkest moments, it has spoken to give me the comfort I have needed, the wisdom I have needed in the darkest moments when I have faced grave decisions. Oh yes, oh yes, I've had my moments of doubt. I've looked back at judgment calls I've made and doubted, did I do the right thing? And look at and think, well, if I had known then what I know now, I would have done differently. But where am I any different than the rest of you? This is the human condition. We learn as we go along. And God is merciful. My Bible tells me that. He's merciful if I'm just trying to do the best I can, imperfect though it be. And this brings me such comfort. The book has never let me down. So I go back. I look at the arguments for the doctrine I believe. I look at the proofs. Nobody has yet been able to show me that I'm wrong, and so I stay coarse. I don't know anything else I can do. But do I have those moments that I'm with John the Baptist and wonder about the reality of it all? You bet. And so do you. I think one of the most beautiful prayers to be found in the entirety of the Bible is recorded in the book of the Gospel of John, pardon me, the Gospel of Mark and chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 and verse 24. Jesus says to a man whose son was tormented with the devil and he comes to Christ to do something about it because the disciples had been unable to cast the devil out. And we read in verse 23 where Jesus says to the man, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That was an honest man that knew that even though he believed, he struggled with doubts. If you are expecting a 100% convincing of what we teach here to ever sign on with it, you never will. There will always be doubts that will creep in. The adversary will always whisper in your ear, Yea, hath God said? Are you sure you're interpreting that right? You sure you've got that right? No. It's like I said last Sunday, or the Sunday before. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. The the Bible says the light of the just, is is uh, the path of the just rather, Proverbs 4 is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. You just follow the light as far as it shines. More you cannot do. And then when you reach that point, it shines further. And when you reach that point, it shines further. I came to that conviction years ago, and it has stood me in good stead. 
as I've had to face decisions and deal with difficult things in life. But now, having given you these Bible verses that talk about true believers that struggle with doubt and struggle with questions, I want to give you some readings now. Some readings. And I I can't say it better. I want to read to you from an excellent book, but you have to read it like you do everything. Called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was an atheist. And he later on professed to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to read something to you. This is excellent. I, 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 and I, I would ask you to please pay careful attention to this. He said, the battle is between faith and reason on one side and emotion and imagination on the other. He said, I am not asking anyone to accept Christianity if his best reasoning tells him that the weight of the evidence is against it. Don't accept this if you think the weight of the evidence is against it. If you think there's weighty evidence that what is taught and preached and practiced in the church is wrong, I would not ask you to go against reason. I would just ask you to please share with me your reason, perchance if I am wrong, because remember, truth does not shun investigation. I'm not asking anyone to accept Christianity if his best reasoning tells him the weight of the evidence is against it. This is not the point at which faith comes in. But supposing a man's reason once decides that the weight of the evidence is for it, I can tell that man what is going to happen to him in the next few weeks. There will come a moment when there is bad news or he is in trouble or is living among a lot of other people who do not believe it. And all at once his emotions will rise up and carry out a sort of a blitz on his belief. Or else there will come a moment when he wants a woman, or wants to tell a lie, or feels very pleased with himself, or sees a chance of making a little more money in some way that's not perfectly fair. Some moment, in fact, at which it would be very convenient if Christianity were not true. And once again, his wishes and desires will carry out a blitz. I'm not talking of moments at which any real new reasons against Christianity turn up. Those have to be faced, and that is a different matter. Remember, truth does not shun investigation. I'm talking about moments where a mere mood rises against it. Do you always, are you always in the mood to be a good Christian? If you are, you're different from I. Or from me. Different from I am. From me. Well, whatever. Trying to think of whether the from there is functioning as a conjunctive adverb or whether it's functioning from me. Preposition, all right. Because sometimes those prepositions function otherwise and it throws you. I'm sure all of you recognize that. Sorry if I offended your sense of grammar. Uh, uh, Lichtitude. Uh, correctness. Correctness. Yeah, pardon me. I couldn't think of the English word. Okay. I'm really <laughs> getting bad. When I came out from surgery, I do remember this one thing. They were pulling those tubes out of me. And I was speaking German. And I, I can remember them saying, we don't understand that. I didn't care. For some reason, that's all I could think to do was speak German. So I did. I think it was German. It may have been another one. I don't know. As long as it was clean. That's what I hope. Anyway. So we said, I'm not talking of moments at which any real new reasons against Christianity turn up. Those have to be faced, and that is a different matter. I'm talking about moments where a mere mood rises up against it, and we all experience that. Now, faith, in the sense of which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. For moods will change. Whatever view your reason takes. Now listen to this. This is classic. I know that by experience. This was a man that was once an atheist, but now professes to be a Christian. Moods will change whatever view your reason takes. 
I know that by experience. Now that I am a Christian, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. Do you get what he said? As a Christian, I had my moments when I doubt it. But when I was an atheist, I had my moments when I doubted that. And I'd rather doubt the religion. I'd rather struggle with doubting the religion that at least promises me an eternal existence and good afterlife under certain circumstances than one that promises me nothing when I die. I'd rather fight this fight of faith than to fight the faith of believing there is no God. And he says, this rebellion of your moods against your real self is going to come anyway. That is why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where they get off, you can, neither, you can never be either a sound Christian or even a sound atheist but just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs, really dependent on the weather and the state of its digestion. Consequently, one must train the habit of faith. Are you following this? Are you following this? This is good stuff. The first step is to recognize the fact that your moods change. And they do. The next is to make sure that if you have once accepted Christianity, then some of its main doctrines shall be deliberately held before your mind for some time every day. That is why daily prayer and religious reading and church going are necessary parts of the Christian life. We have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Neither this belief nor any other will automatically remain alive in the mind. It must be fed. And as a matter of fact, if you examined a hundred people who had lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them would turn out to have been reasoned out of it by honest argument. Do not most people simply drift away? Because something in this world pulls at them and Christianity gets in the way. Oh, that's worth its weight in gold. The belief has to be fed. Fed by prayer, fed by reading, keeping what we believe before us constantly, fed by going to church. Let me tell you something interesting I found one time. In the Chicago area, there is actually, I don't know if they call it a church or not, but it's everything like a church. They've got Sunday school, they have a meeting, they have songs, they have... Uh, speeches very much like a church for atheists. Seriously. It has all the trappings of a church for atheists. What are those people doing? They're feeding their faith that there is no God. They're feeding it just like we're feeding ours this morning. There is that that we need. But then this one. In an excellent book called The Rage Against God... How Atheism Led Me to Faith, by a British reporter named Peter Hitchens. Tremendous book. I got that thing, I devoured it. I think I had it done maybe in a couple of days. The Rage Against God. How Atheism Led Me to Faith. This man wrote, I would counter as a believer that I most definitely have motives for my belief. And I do too. I believe in God in the Christian religion at least partly because it suits me to do so. I'm not going to stand here and deny this works for me. That's one reason, not the only reason, but it is a reason. It works for me. I prefer to believe that I live in an ordered universe with a purpose that I can at least partly discover. I derive my ideas of what is absolutely true and what is absolutely right from this source. I need these ideas many times each day. How else can I function as a parent, as a citizen, as a reporter? I should be desolated if it could ever be proved that theism is false. But I'm human, fallen, and flawed, so I'm slippery about this faith which has a reasonably good effect on me when I try hard to follow it. 
but can be a great nuisance to me when I wish to follow the devices and desires of my own heart. And I, I love this, can, this candor. From time to time, I also try to wriggle out of the laws to which I have sworn obedience. I then reject parts of the teaching of my faith, those parts that condemn what I want to think or say or do. I can usually find clever and ingenious arguments for doing this. I invariably do so because it suits me personally. In this, I am doing exactly what the atheist does, only not to the same extent, because I do not actively wish for disorder and meaninglessness. I recognize that if I pull down the pillars of the moral universe, I too will be crushed when the roof falls. If I pull down the pillars of the, of the, uh, of the moral universe, I too will be crushed when the roof falls. These laws that sometimes get in my way protect me. They protect you. They protect your marriage. They protect your home. They protect your reputation. He said, so I follow my failure with regret and hope for forgiveness yet again. This is an argument for the belief that humanity is imperfect and fallen, not a condemnation of faith or of God. Because a Christian doesn't always live up to the code. That's not the fault of the code. That's the fault of the Christian. He said, and in all my experience of life, I have seldom seen a more powerful argument for the fallen nature of man and his inability to achieve perfection than those countries in which man set himself up to replace God with the state. How true. All one had to do was make a tour of communist Russia, an atheistic state, and look at the living conditions and see what happens when you rule God out of the equation. Your protections, when you remove the pillars, the roof caves in on you. And so, brethren, when we go back to Romans 12, let your love be without dissimulation. We've all got a battle on our hands, don't we? Because of the struggle we have with our fallen nature in a world that appeals to it. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, appealing to our fallen nature, leaves us with a battle every day to keep it real. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And in order to that, I close with Hebrews chapter 3. I said I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on each and every snippet of instruction, and I've spent two Sundays on this. We might get done with this series by the time 2.23 closes out. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily, as I do all of you today. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. But actually, I wanted verse 12. Take heed, my brethren. I'm talking to church members. I'm talking to brethren. Hebrews 3.12. Take heed. Watch out. Be careful. Because we're all susceptible to this, as I have proven. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Amen. Oh,